Well, good evening, everybody. I told these up here I was tempted to say good morning because I'm used to doing this in the morning, but it's good evening. And welcome to One Family Worship. It's been a great day already in the house of the Lord. We already had the opportunity to baptize three people in our second service uh, this morning. And tonight, we've got one special candidate coming uh, to announce her faith and for baptism. Haley, come on down. Uh, this is Haley Wells. Uh, she is the uh, daughter of Aaron and Jennifer Wells. And back in 2018, she made a profession to follow Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Came down a couple weeks ago to make that profession uh, public. And this evening, she comes in obedience to believers' baptism. Let's move this. this way. There you go. Haley, what is your confession? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Go ahead and grab it. Haley, it's upon that public profession of faith that I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, good evening, everybody. It's so good to see all of you here. You know what? The folks that aren't here, they're going to miss it. Don't you feel sorry for them? I do. I really do. It's going to be a great night of worship together to begin with, though. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to stand and greet everyone, okay? Let's pray. Father, already when we walked into this place, we could feel your presence. Thank you, Lord, for being with us as we gather here to worship you and praise you, Lord, not only as Lord and Savior, but our King. Father God, we pray you would speak through the music, through the spoken word, to all of the hearts through the words of testimony that will be given tonight. May everything that's said and done bring honor and glory to you and you alone. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and welcome each other tonight. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise
our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I
I'm Melanie Miles, and on September the 26th, 2019, I was involved in a horrific car accident. A young man traveling approximately 101 miles an hour T-boned my car, and because my car was not flipping fast enough, he then impacted my car again at 88 miles an hour. Now, I'd like to say that's where my journey began with God, but see, he was already working before that. My accident happened in the front yard of Ricky and Rima Robinson, and they were out of town. You see, God had given them an opportunity to work in Orlando, Florida, and because of that, their daughter Sheena, who was a nursing student, was at their home. She heard the accident and came to the car where she not only just kept me company, but she also did things that saved my life. Hey, I'm Josiah Fulbright. I was electrocuted on August 15, 2019. I came in contact with a live wire, working on power lines for a local contractor, working in Brundage, Alabama. I was life flighted to UAB in Birmingham. I was unconscious for a week, and when I when I woke up, I don't I don't have any memories for a whole week. And when I woke up, my wife was there in ICU, uh, Mary, and I told her that I loved her. That was the first thing I said. And then uh, my parents came in, and then uh, about the third thing I said was I, I told them that I seen Jesus when I was unconscious. It went like black all the way around me, like couldn't see nothing. I remember looking around, and Jesus was standing there. Uh, head to toe the full man was standing there and uh, he reached his hand out like he was like stretching his hand really far like he was trying to get me up off the ground 
And he looked at me dead in the eye, and he said, I got this, son. And when he told me that, it was over, almost instantaneous. I just, it was so fresh on my mind. It's just like you couldn't tell anybody enough. I told the nurses, I told the doctors, I told family, everybody, anybody that came to visit me. And it's still like that, but it's just so vivid in your mind, you know, that it, it, it's like words don't even do it justice, you know. And I think that's the way heaven will be, you know, when people think about heaven and, and all, it's just nothing of this world, you know. It's just so just vivid. When I was taken to the medical center, it was decided the best thing because of my head injury was to be airlifted to UAB. When I got to UAB, I had received already close to four units of blood, and after examination, I had over 30 broken bones, including um, the vertebrae in my neck, which I should have been paralyzed, several lacerations, and um, head trauma that they were not really sure what to do at that moment. I had surgery on my hips and my neck, and to uh, close all the lacerations. They told my family and friends that it would be approximately six to 12 months before I would return to a normal life. But they didn't know my God, as we do. Because at nine to 10 weeks, I was here in Dothan in physical therapy, and I walked for the first time with a walker. It wasn't pretty, but I walked. After that, it became a cane, and not long after that, I lost the cane. Now at four months, at what should have been a long, painful recovery, I'm back at home, living by myself, driving, and walking with very little pain. God has shown himself through every step of the way. There were some tough times during that week. It was a little touch and go, but... He's there. He's there for us when we need him, and he wasn't there just for me. He was there for my family and everybody else at the time. There was some rough surgeries to go through. I lost my arm and my ear and my nose, but that's all right. It's just part of the plan. And when people say that uh, God's got a plan, you don't always know what that entails, but he. He's in control of everything, and he uh, he knows what's the best for everybody. Because uh, just because I got hurt and everything that I went through, there's no telling how many people that it's touched along the way, and how many people it's going to touch. Because I'm just 23, I have a lot more living than I plan on doing between now and then. One day at physical therapy, when I was having therapy for three to four hours a day, six days a week. And on this particular day, it was hard. Um, what they were asking me to do, I wasn't sure I could. I was exhausted physically, mentally, and emotionally. And out of the blue, I get this text from my oldest daughter, Kristen, and it said, Mom, I know what you're going through is hard. But you gotta remember, when David faced Goliath, he never once talked about how dangerous it was. He just claimed the power of God, and then he did it. So mom, I'm just gonna need you to be a David. Well, I had to be a David. Now I've not conquered all of my Goliaths yet, but with God's power, I plan on conquering them. And we'll all have Goliaths in the future. And my prayer is, not just for me, but for everyone, that when we're faced with our Goliath, we'll just choose to be a David. When people say live life to the fullest every day, that, that's a very true statement because, like I said, it can be taken just instant. But I would say to go out and be uh, just don't meet a stranger just 
talk to everybody because like I said, you don't know what they're going through. You don't know who you can help. Somebody that's your best friend might look fine all the time, but they might be going through something every day. And just just be that person for them that they, that, that, that they need. And tell them about Jesus. Have Josiah and Melanie here in the house with us tonight. Two people that very possibly couldn't have been. And tonight they are here to worship right alongside of us to celebrate Jesus Christ because of what Jesus Christ has done. Hey, do you mind standing up? Just here's Josiah and Melanie. She she's trying to hide from us in the back. But the fact that they can come in here and stand up is a testament to the power of our God. Can we just sing that chorus again, celebrating that our God is a way maker? Let's do that together. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on, believe that tonight. Sing it out. And way maker, miracle worker, Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, it is, yeah. Sing way maker, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you Never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, come on, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. 
time, sing Waymaker. And Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you
And Father, we do praise you tonight. We ask now that you would bless us, not only with your presence as you already have, God, but that you would pour out your grace, that you would empower our pastor as he's going to come in a moment to speak to us. Fill him up with the Holy Spirit. Give him the words that you would have us here tonight. And as we get ready to give our tithes and our offerings to you, God, as an act of worship, we ask that you would take them, use them, multiply them for your glory so that the gospel may go out so that more can know the glories of our God. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, all right. Aren't you glad you're here tonight? Aren't you glad you made it out and that you came to worship? Aren't you glad? Let's give the Lord a hand. Yeah. Uh, and I'm so glad that you're here as well. And by the way, I have a friend with me here uh, this evening, and I met her recently on uh, my flight from uh, Atlanta back to Dothan. It's Dr. Deborah Petway. Wave at them, Deborah, right here down front. And we, uh, she was... Uh, she drew the unlucky straw and had to sit by me on the plane, and we laughed. I think we laughed and talked uh, all the way from Atlanta uh, to Dothan, and she, we got to talking about the Lord and about uh, things that the Lord has done, and she got to sharing about her church and where she's at, and I said, I preached at your church. She said, I know, I was there. And, uh, but we had a good uh, conversation. She knows the Lord and loves the Lord, and I said, you need to come to One Family Worship on uh, Sunday night, and she said, I will. I, she said, I'm, I'm going to try to do just that, and she did. And by the way, um, uh, Deborah, not too many people actually say they will. They say it because the preacher invited them. Oh, yeah, I'll be there, preacher. But she not only said she would, she did, and uh, I'm so glad that you're here uh, with us tonight. I want to invite you to take your copy of God's Word and open up to the book of Psalms, uh, uh, chapter 145. We're going to read that passage in just a moment. I wonder, did everybody get an outline? Does anybody need one of the outlines? Okay, if you'll hold your hand up over here. Uh, guys, if you will grab those and uh, make your way in. Our ushers have gone to sleep in the back. 
Uh, no, they're here. If you'll hold your hand up, uh, they'll see that hand. And uh, be sure to give them $5, by the way, when they hand you an outline. Uh, did I, I didn't mention uh, that. Oh, okay, well, I hope you'll do that. By the way, while they're doing that, let me also invite you to go with us to the Holy Land next December the 29th. I'll be leading, I don't know, my sixth or seventh uh, trip to the Holy Land. I hope you can go with us already. Numbers of folks are, are uh, signing up, and uh, I'd love for you to be one of them. You can get a brochure out in the Welcome Center if you'd like to go with us. But uh, this evening, we're going to talk about praise and worship. I don't know if you noticed the theme, but uh, that was uh, when we began to plan this one family of worship, we wanted to center it around uh, praising God and honoring God for the, the things that He's done. You've heard the testimonies of Melanie and Josiah. It really is remarkable. And by the way, a video just doesn't even hardly uh, suffice to tell those stories because they're such stories of God's hand being involved in both of their lives. But we praise Him because He is the way maker, isn't it? He makes a way. The Bible says, says he'll make a way in the wilderness where there seems to be no way. Uh, he can do that because he is God, and that's one of the reasons that we praise him. I want to read some verses to you. I'm not going to ask you, as I normally do, to stand when we read the Scripture because it is a lengthy text, but I'm going to read it, and I want you to follow along. Beginning in verse uh, 1 of chapter 145, uh, this psalm, a psalm of David, he said, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Amen to that. The Lord is good to all, and His mercy is over all that He has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, that we can gather in this place to praise you for your abundant goodness, your greatness, your power, Father, the mighty deeds of your hands, Father, and your mercy and grace. And Father, in these few moments, as we reflect upon just who you are, God, let us praise you in our hearts and with our lips and with our lives. God, speak to us now from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Now, by the way, I want to welcome all of those who are joining us. They tell me, I just got a message a moment ago, that we have a very large crowd that is joining us by live stream. Welcome. We're glad. We wish you could be here with us. There's just nothing like being here in person. Amen? But we're glad you've been able to join us by live stream video. Let's welcome them, Ridgecrest. Would you do that? Now, of this psalm that we've just read... Uh, Spurgeon said it was David's favorite psalm of praise. Uh, it was his very own psalm of praise, Spurgeon writes. Uh, it is altogether praise. It is praise pitched in a high key. David had blessed God many a time in other psalms, but this is regarded as his peculiar, very personal. It is his crown of jewel of praise, you might say. And certainly David's praise is the best of praise that he can offer, for it is that of a man of experience and a man of sincerity. It's of a man of calm deliberation and of intense warmth of the heart. We may take David's psalm as a model and aim at making our own personal adoration as much like this psalm as it was to uh, David. 
And so with that in mind, this evening, as we think about praise, I want to I talk to you about four expressions of praise and thanks that were offered to God by David, but should also characterize our praise and our thanks back to God. When you think of God, you should reflect on who God is, and that should overflow into praise and a thanksgiving to Him. I heard about an old country fellow, and uh, he uh, was considered a bit old-fashioned, and he went to uh, visit a, a large church in the city. And as uh, the minister eloquently drove home some great truth or some great idea, this country fella uh, got so worked up about that great idea, he just stood up and yelled out, Praise the Lord! And when he did, an usher rushed in quickly, tapped him on the shoulder and arm, and he whispered to him, he said, Sir, be quiet. You can't praise the Lord in this church. Well, listen, God pity both the preacher and the church that doesn't gather to praise and worship God when it comes together. Our word worship really is related to the, the idea of He is worthy, and because He is worthy, we worship Him. And by the way, worship is something that should be done with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Every corpuscle of your being ought to be dedicated toward the praise and the honor of our great God. He is worthy of our praise. And so like David, we should first praise Him for his unsearchable greatness. Did you see that in verse 3? Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. The first uh, reason uh, that we should praise God is simply because of the greatness of who he is. And David makes that clear uh, about his greatness, that it is God's greatness and it is vast, and we cannot begin to grasp it. When we praise God, you know what we're doing? We are reverencing God. Um, in 1717, Louis XIV of France died. And he had, uh, before he had died in, in the earlier years of his reign, he had demanded that he be referred to as Louis the Great. Uh, he was a monarch, and he declared, not only am I great, I am the state, is what he said. And uh, his court, there, we are told, uh, historically was one of the most magnificent in all of Europe, and his funeral, when he died, we are told, was one of the most spectacular. And in the church where the ceremony was performed, his body lay in a golden coffin. And to, to, it was put there to dramatize the greatness of Louis XIV, uh, Louis the Great. And orders had been given by him prior to his death that the cathedral would be very dimly lit with only one special candle that was to be set right directly above his coffin. So that all eyes would be directed, no lights anywhere else, but all uh, eyes would be directed toward that one candle lit above his co uh, coffin, uh, calling attention once again to Louis the Great. The thousands of people in attendance waited in silence. And then the bishop, Bishop Maslin, began to speak. And slowly as he spoke, he reached down and he snuffed out the candle. And then he said, only God is great. No man is great. Would you agree we have a tendency to elevate the wrong things and the wrong people? Only God is great. And that's what David is talking about. The greatness of God is reflected in his unlimited power. Job said, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? God says to Job, Job, where were you? When I, I put it all together, tell me if you have understanding. Uh, God is great because of His unlimited power. He is great because of His unrestrained presence. In Psalm 139, verse 7, the psalmist writes, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? And God is great because of His unimaginable position. Don't you love the words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 6, and verse 1 and following? He writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. He was high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He's describing this magnificent sight of the greatness of God. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory." 
and the foundations of the threshold you know, shook, and the voice of him who called uh, out to them caused the household to shake, and the house was filled with smoke. That's a picture, isn't it? And Isaiah said, I saw the king high and lifted up, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, his unimaginable position. Friends, listen to me. The greatness and the vastness of the universe uh, themselves declare to, uh, the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. You look around you, and you can see the glory of God in cre creation. You look around you, you'll see the glory of God in an infant. By the way, you look around you, and you'll see the glory of God displayed in a grandson. <laughs> I had to work that into the message somewhere. What a great privilege to worship a great God. Amen? You know why? Because as great as he is, he still knows your name. Seven billion of us, they tell us, on this planet, and he knows all of us by name. And that doesn't include the countless billions of people who have come and gone. He knows us by name. What an incredible God. And David says, I, when I take it all in, all I can do is praise the greatness of the majesty and power and glory of God, and that he would condescend, think about that, to a relationship with us. Wow. Wow. But there's something else to notice here, and that is we praise Him not only for His greatness, we praise Him for His abundant goodness. Look what David says in verses 7, verses 9. He said, he said they shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness. And then in verse 9, the Lord is good to all. We praise Him for His abundant goodness. You see, by nature, our minds tend to focus on badness. Have you noticed that about you? We tend to focus on badness. You know how bad things are. You know how bad my life is. You know how bad my circumstances are. You know how bad I feel. You know how bad uh, others are, etc. That's what we tend to focus on. The devil loves to keep us in despair and discourage us by getting us to live by our sight. And when we live by our sight, we tend to see what's wrong with everything. But when you walk by faith, listen, you look and see your God. And you realize how good he is. In the midst of a world in turmoil, in the midst of tragedy, we still can find and see the goodness of our God. We are to live by faith. And we are to see life through the lens of faith. That's not putting on rose-colored glasses. You've heard that expression, so it colors everything the way you want it to be. No, it's putting on a spiritual filter. It's putting on a faith filter. It's putting on a God filter. It's putting on a God-filtered pair of lenses that came to us when we came in, uh, into relationship with Him, and it causes us to see what others see as badness and brokenness. We don't deny that, but it causes us to see a God who is full of goodness in the, uh, a world full of badness that he saved us that's the goodness and mercy of God Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4 he says for this light momentary affliction by the way if you're going through affliction or difficulty do you know why you can praise him because it's light and momentary you say well it doesn't feel that way a lot of times it doesn't feel that way but in the grand scheme of eternity affliction is light and momentary because of eternity that is ahead for us and Paul writes and says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us, what? He says, for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient. They're passing away. But the things that are unseen are eternal. He says, you know how you make sense out of the, the vicissitudes? You know how you make sense out of the pains and the difficulties and those circumstances and the tribulations of life? He says, you make sense because we walk by faith. Our eyes are, are on the eternal things. We know that this world is brief, momentary, and the affliction therefore is light. It's going to pass. It's why the church has always referred to the coming of Jesus Christ as our blessed hope. It's going to get us out of this stuff and one day. And often we miss the goodness of God because we focus on all the bad around us. And we even assume that God is not good because of what our, our false view of ultimate reality is. So when you find yourself seeing bad, Here's some things to remember about the goodness of God. First, remember His enduring patience with you. Only a good God could be so patient. 
2 Peter 3, 9 says that, that God is patient, not willing that any of us should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When you start seeing the bad in your life, remind yourself of the goodness of God and His patience towards you. All of us could give testimony. Aren't you glad that God has been patient with you? That God didn't give you what you deserve. Aren't you glad? His patience. So remember that. His enduring patience. It's not just momentary patience. God has enduringly been patient with us. And then remember his irrevocable passion for you. God really does love us. In spite of our rebellion and our disobedience, God really loves us. And he wants this relationship uh, to be dynamic. That's why Paul would write in Romans 8 and say, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He really loves you. He's crazy about you. One pastor said this, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. I mean, he really loves you like that. And then when you tend to see the badness, instead stop and think about his daily provision for you. You are here. You are here. You had a day today because God granted that to you. And God provided that for you. God has given you another day in Acts 17. Um, Luke writes, for in him we live and move and exist, uh, and, and we have our being, for we are also his offspring. He's our provider, because we're his offspring. Now today, prices are high. They're getting higher about a lot of things. And talk about uh, high prices. A man went to a grocery store, I heard about, with a shopping bag full of money, and he came home with a billfold full of groceries. Listen, you've been in that situation before. It's tough, and I'm not minimizing or trivializing it because we all need relief. But folks, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. God is your provider, and God has, has promised to provide for all of those who will turn to Him in trust. I tell you, we're so blessed, aren't we? We're so blessed. 85% of people in this world don't have enough to eat, and we throw away enough in our garbage cans almost to feed another nation. And so many of us, rather than being humbly grateful, we're grumbly hateful. We've forgotten the goodness of God. We need to learn how to praise the Lord and thank God. And if you can't be thankful for what you receive, you ought to be thankful for what you're not receiving. Because apart from Christ, we all deserve judgment. And that's reason enough. Wouldn't you agree that's reason enough, like the psalmist, to praise God and sing songs of thanksgiving and with gratitude because of His, uh, uh, because of his goodness toward us? I wonder, when was the last time that you paused and just reflected on God's goodness in your life? But there's a third thing that David, I think, teaches us here, and that we should praise him not only for his greatness and not only for his goodness, but we should praise him for his mercy and his grace. Look at verse 8. The Lord is gracious. He's gracious. He's abundantly gracious, and he's merciful. And David acknowledges that God hasn't just been good to him. God has been full of grace and mercy toward him. And the idea here is that the compassion of God has caused God to extend His grace to us. And as a result of that, David is saying, because He has extended a grace to me. And you know, grace is not something you deserve. That's why it's grace. Because God has been gracious to me. He's extended this grace to me. He said, I praise Him. I praise Him for the goodness. I praise Him for His greatness. But I praise Him for His grace. Notice that David says that God is slow to anger. That's grace. That's His mercy. That is compassion. And friend, let me tell you, that's good news. That God is slow uh, to anger. And that's why we call the gospel good news. God has dealt with us graciously rather than in anger. Think about this. If, if, if you or I were God, I bet we wouldn't put up with us. Think about that. I bet you wouldn't put up with yourself, would you, if you were God? That's why you're not God, because you wouldn't put up with me either. And I wouldn't put up with you. I'd be running around zapping people. Zzz, 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 zzz. I would conveniently miss myself. Zzz, oh, <laughs> miss. I tried. Um, <clears throat> but think about it. That's why it's grace. You wouldn't put up with, with who you are, but God does. You know why? Because He loves you. He's merciful to you. 
I heard about a lost dog that had posted a, uh, that had a, a big reward posted for its return if it were found. And here was the description of the dog. It said, he's only got three legs. <laughs> he's blind in the left eye. He's missing a right ear. His tail has been broken off. He was neutered accidentally by a fence. Ouch. <laughs> he's almost deaf. And he answers by the name of Lucky. <laughs> Friend, that dog isn't Lucky. That dog is loved. The owner says, with all of his problems, I love that dog. I, I want to I pay a ransom for that dog. And he's lucky because he's got an owner who loves him and wants him back. Listen, that's what redemption is all about. God looked at you and me and he said, you're broken. Nobody would pay a ransom for you, but I will. And I'll not only pay a ransom, I'll pay the highest price available. I'll send my one and only son because I love you and I want you back. We're a mess, but God is full of grace and compassion. And so he gave us his son in order to get us back. And I want to tell you something. David is saying that should cause us to praise God with our lives forever until we are connected and united with him in heaven. But there's one last thing I want you to see this evening. And that is, David also tells us we ought to praise him for his power and glorious kingdom. We ought to praise him for his power and his glorious kingdom. It says in verse 11 through 13, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. What's he talking about in these verses, 11 through 13? What, what is he talking about when he says that about the kingdom? And he, He's talking about the fact that the kingdom of God is elevated above all the other kingdoms of the world and of all time and throughout all of history. And the kingdom of God will endure forever. And if you know Jesus Christ, you're a part of an enduring kingdom, the kingdoms of men. I talked to you about this in a recent message. They come, they rise and fall. The greatest empires have risen up, and everybody thought they'd last forever, but they didn't. But there's one kingdom that stands above all. It is the eternal kingdom of God. And we can praise God because if we know Christ, we are a part of that kingdom and we can say our citizenship is in heaven and we have an, etern uh, an enduring uh, uh, kingdom that we are a part of and a, and a God and Savior that will not uh, depart from us. That's what he's talking about. He says, so it's going to endure forever. You see, the glory of this world's kingdoms are going to fade. As I've told you, the glory of the United States will fade. There's a day coming when it will fade. The earth's empires have come and they have gone uh, until all that is left of them are the exhibits and the ruins and the museums. But I want to tell you, uh, there is one kingdom that's never, ever going to pass. No matter what the other kingdoms have been known for, the kingdom of God is known for its enduring, eternal treasure to the people of God. Gone are the pomp and the power of Pharaoh's Egypt. Gone is the imperial might of Nineveh. Gone is the glory of Greece, the power of imperial Rome. Gone is the former Soviet Union's hope of conquering the world. Gone is Spain's former splendor. Gone is Napoleon's fallen empire. And one day, perhaps, gone will be what we call the American experiment. The thing that is, is important to us is to take care, certainly, of our responsibilities in the kingdoms that we operate in. But most of all, it is important for us to attach ourselves to the kingdom that lasts forever. And David ex, uh, extolled the kingdom of God. He didn't extol his own kingdom. Think, think about this. Uh, David is considered the greatest king Israel ever had, aside from Jesus Christ. David is the greatest king they ever had, but David doesn't extol his kingdom in this. You know what kingdom he extols and elevates? The kingdom of God. The most powerful kingdom, by the way, still even on the planet earth is the kingdom of God because God is in control. Even the enemies of, of the world's kingdoms have their coming and going only at his allowance. God is in control. And this is a, a, a part of the kingdom of God when we give our lives to him and associate ourselves with that kingdom. David says it. The scriptures affirm it. The coming kingdom 
should inspire awe in us, praise in us, thanksgiving uh, from us, until time shall be no more. That kingdom is the kingdom that we should keep our eyes upon. You'll get discouraged if you put your eyes on this kingdom. You'll have periods where you think it's all well, and then periods where you think it can't, it can't work or it can't happen. Listen, there's only one kingdom to keep your eyes on. Live as responsible citizens in the kingdom you're in, but I want to tell you something. Live knowing that your ultimate citizenship is in heaven. And all of this is going to pass away. This world is passing away. All of it's going to pass away. That's why it's so important that you be a part of that kingdom. And David was, and that's why he could praise God. He praised Him for His greatness. He praised Him for His goodness. He praised Him for His grace. He praised Him for His glorious kingdom. Listen to what the Psalm, uh, Psalms go on to say. In Psalm 147, 1, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. Now, what, what that means is this, that God created us not primarily to serve Him. I mean, if He had wanted something to serve Him, He could have he made machines to serve Him. He, he could got the angels to serve Him exclusively as they do. If, if all He needed was service. But listen, God created everything, living and non-living, to be one great chorus of praise to Him. Today we praise Him with our songs. We praise Him with our sacrifices and our service and our surrender. There's no greater way to say to God than than I I serve you and I, I surrender to you by giving your life to Him. Psalm 34 says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalm 22 says this, You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him and stand in awe of Him. All of you offspring of Israel. Psalm 69, 34 says, Let heaven and earth praise Him, the seas and everything that moves in them. Psalm 107, 32, Let them extol Him in the congregation of the people uh, and praise Him in the assembly of the elders. Psalm 109, 30, With my mouth I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise Him in the midst of the throng. Psalm 140, verses 1 through 4. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him all His angels. Praise Him all His hosts. Praise Him sun and moon. Praise Him all you shining stars. Praise Him you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. And Psalm 150 verses 1 through 6 say, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath come praise the Lord. That's what He said. Do you think we ought to praise God? I think we ought to praise God. But do you know the greatest way you can praise God? You know the greatest way you can praise God? Is by giving your life to Jesus Christ. Do you know what Paul wrote in Romans 12? He said the the acceptable and pleasing act of worship is that we give our bodies to Him. He means that we live our lives for Him, that we surrender ourselves to His Lordship. The greatest way that you can bring praise to God is by surrendering yourself to Him alone. Look, did you know the birds praise Him? Do you know the animals praise God? Do you know, listen, it's just possible sometime when you listen to that bird chirping out there, it's singing out a song of praise. I I don't know how true this is, but some years ago I read about a, 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 a witch doctor in an unreached tribe, and he finally came to Christ and uh, he was uh, obviously connected with demonic and satanic things, whether he understood it or not, but he literally was a kind of Dr. Doolittle, or so he told after he came uh, to, uh, uh, to Christ, and how the, he could listen to the animals, and he said, praise God. And he said, it would infuriate me, these animals. And the birds would, in the morning, you would wake up and you would hear them singing praises to God, the God uh, creator, and it infuriated me, he said. Until I came to Christ, and then I began to realize everything that has breath, let it bring praise to God. Look, the things, the rocks praise God. Did you know that? Jesus said, if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out, and they'll praise me. All of creation understands that the people that don't get it sometimes, 
our humanity. We have been created to praise Him. And the greatest praise that you can offer to Him would be to give your life to Him. And you know what? It would be, it would be kind of crazy. Band, I'm going to ask you all to come back if you would. It would be kind of crazy for me to get here and to preach about praise and talk to you about praise and say, give your life to Christ. By the way, people have already done it here today. People have given their life and confessed Christ today in this place. Praise God for that. There are people that have been added to our congregation today. Praise God for that. We are a fellowship designed to praise and glorify God with our lives and with our lips. And the way you start that is to come to Christ. If you're here tonight and you've never, or you're not sure, and you've never given your life to Christ, you're just not sure that you're saved, you need to come tonight and say, I need to get saved. Do what people have already done today and confess Him as your Savior and your Lord. There may be some other reason that you, look, look, tonight's a perfect time. This is a, I told you this is a great evening, isn't it? And maybe you say, man, I need a church home. Well, come and connect to this place. People have done that today already. Maybe you need a church home. Come and say, Pastor, I want to connect with this place. Whatever the case may be, come and pray around this altar. It's not for show, you know. There's power in prayer. We believe that. And there's power in a bent knee. Do you know why that is? Because a bent knee is saying, I recognize that I am humbling myself before the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. I recognize who you are, and I am humbly bowing before you, and I'm laying before you the petitions of my heart. You know what? Not a bad thing to come and bend your knee and offer a prayer of praise to God, a prayer of thanksgiving to God. Has God been good to you? I want to suggest that He's been good to all of us. And maybe you just want to come and bend the knee and say, God, I just want to tell you how good <clears throat> You've been to me. I just want to say it, God. How good is the Lord our God? How good you've been good to me, Lord. Thank you for saving me. I wasn't worth saving, but you didn't save me because I was worth it. You saved it because you created me and you loved me and you had purpose and plan for me. God, thank you. And if you don't know him, you come and say, I need him. And so in this time, I'm going to pray. And after that, I'm going to step down here. We'll have staff member in other places. And maybe you just want to come to one. Maybe you need somebody to pray with you. Just ask them, would you pray with me? Maybe you just want to praise the Lord. Maybe you just want to uh, lay some, some decision before him at the altar, bent knee, whatever it may be. Don't miss an opportunity to say thank you or to say, God, here I am humbly before you here. God, let, let's don't worry about what other people think about us bending our knees. Amen. Let's just bend the knee before God. Father, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like David, we praise you for your greatness, God. We praise you for your goodness uh, to us, God. We praise you for your grace, uh, God. We praise you for your kingdom, the greatness of it, Lord. We praise you for all of these things. You are such a good God, and we are so blessed to know you. For those who do not, I pray that tonight they'll come and receive you. For those, Father, that need a place to worship you, I pray that you'll bring them tonight to come and say, I want to be a part of this place. Whatever it may be, Father, would you minister to us and to our hearts right now in this time of invitation before we're gone, God, and let us say thank you. Thank you. And praise be to the name of our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as the band plays? I invite you to slip out right now. You slip out and you come on. We're here. I'm here to receive you. Staff are here to receive you. This altar is open for you, whatever the case may be. You slip out right now. Come on. Balcony will take you a little bit, so you get started now. But you come on.